Welcome to the third installment of our webinar series, Leading Through Crisis, hosted by the Guelph Chamber of Commerce and the Gordon S. Lang School of Business and Economics. My name is Crystal Lee Olson, and I will be your moderator for today. I'm a proud Guelph alumni, as well as a leadership professional with Career Compass Canada. Before we get started, if I could ask you to please take a moment to complete the poll that is currently up on your screens. And or if you didn't get a chance to uh, do that and it popped away, you can go down to your toolbar at the bottom and hit polling and that will pop that back up. This poll is going to help our panelists understand who exactly is in the audience today. So our webinar today is going to explore the importance of well-being, positivity, and mental health within your digital teams and how leaders play a crucial role in creating positive, a positive work environment. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Feel free to submit any questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A section. We will try to take a few questions in between segments, but we will also be doing Q&A at the end of the webinar. We have enabled the upvoting on questions, so if you see a question in the Q&A that you would like to have answered, you can simply upvote it by clicking the little thumb, and we'll, we will be addressing the most popular questions. Now let's take our results at the poll that we shared at the beginning of the uh, webinar, which the question was, what's interfering with your well-being these days? So we've got 32% of the audience saying job security and finances, 39% is the emotional roller coaster, 17% strained relationships, 24% at boredom, 51% worried about the future, 19% acquiring resources, 33% media overload and 20% children. And I certainly can relate to these concerns and question and these results as far as uh, my own well being. I know that worrying about the future is something that I certainly uh, keep my mind on of not getting too far ahead of ourselves. So, uh, without further ado, I'd, it's my pleasure to introduce our two experts today. An award-winning researcher, Dr. Jamie Grumman, is a professor and senior research fellow at the Lang School at the University of Guelph. He is the founding chair of the Canadian Positive Psychology Association, which is an organization whose mandate is to improve people's lives by teaching them about the science of a good life. He's published papers in some of the world's top-ranked business journals. His latest book, called Boost, the Science of Recharging Yourself in an Age of Unrelenting Demands. He has been featured in Forbes, Time, Fast Company, New York Times, the BBC and NBC News, and writes regular blogs for the Psychology Today. Our second speaker today is Dr. Sam Sandeep Mishra, an Associate Professor of Management in the Lang School at the University of Guelph. With over 50 publications, many in leading journals, and cited over 1,500 times, Dr. Mishra's research explores the areas of judgment, decision making, mental health, and well being within organizations. He has been a research chair funded by Viterra and KPMG and had, has received over $1.2 million in research funding. So, without further ado, I will pass this over to Jamie Grumman. Thank you very much. I appreciate it and welcome everybody to today's webinar. I just want to uh, make sure everyone can hear me okay. Just give me a thumbs up or something. Can you hear me? All good? Crystal Lee, just give me a nod or a thumbs up or something. All good? Excellent. Just want to make sure. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is well-being and uh, and talk a little bit about how leaders can help to promote it in their organizations. I'm just gonna put a timer on here. I wanna make sure I limit this, uh, these opening comments to about 10 minutes. I practiced this yesterday. I went for about uh, six hours. So uh, I've got the timer going, we'll make sure we stay on track. Um, first off, I wanna thank uh, Alex Fulick. Alex is a business continuity consultant who spoke with me and answered some questions about uh, disaster planning and uh, gave me some, some thoughts that I wanted to include. So thank you to Alex. And uh, I'll start with a stat. Um, this came out just recently. Uh, half of Canadians say that their mental health has recently worsened. It's understandable. Um, and, you know, uh, th there are things we can do to try to address that. Uh, at the same time, it's normal 
uh, for things, to, you know, to, for you to not be at your best. So we're going to talk today about some of the things we can do to try to be at our best, both uh, as an organization member, as an employee, and also just individually, how you can get back to your best when you're feeling drained and uh, by everything that's going on. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but if you have questions, by all means, please pose them uh, in our discussion period. And if we don't get to your questions, please feel free to email me anytime at the university. Just Google me, you can find me easily. So I'm going to focus on two main topics. The first thing I want to focus on is employee needs. So if you're, going to, if you're a leader or even a team member and you want to figure out how to help your colleagues or your employees uh, be at their best and experience as much well-being as they can, I think an effective way to consider this is through the needs people have. So we'll talk about that. And then there are a second half I want to talk about how individuals themselves and you yourself as a leader, uh, and you're a leader depending on whether people follow you or not. It doesn't matter your position in the organization. If people follow you, you're a leader. And you can help people, again, be at their best by recovering effectively. And I'll tell you a little bit about my thoughts about how to make that happen. So first, we'll consider um, needs. So employees' needs, what are they? I'm building on a classic model of employee needs called ERG theory and which suggests that employees have three buckets of needs. The first bucket, the E, is existence. So existence needs refer to material and physiological desires such as food, pay, and physical working conditions. And so what we need to do to satisfy people's needs in this regard is, you know, for people who are still on the payroll, ensure that you're following all the health standards, make sure they're being applied. Um, you wanna demonstrate and talk about the efforts that the organization is making to try to keep people healthy, to try to keep them employed. Um, we're seeing some examples of this in, in organizations. PepsiCo is paying people, some, some of their employees, a little bit more these days. Um, they're offering uh, caregiving benefits, which they, weren't, which they weren't offering before. A bunch of the tech companies like Microsoft and uh, Facebook are agreeing to pay people even if their uh, hours get cut. What employees need during a difficult time like this is they need to know what's going on and you help them satisfy this need, this existential need, by keeping them informed, by talking regularly about what you see happening in the media, what trends you see, what developments you see, and how you're gonna be addressing it. We saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jim Estill, CEO of Danby, talking about how every day he gives a, a wartime CEO update. People need that. But they also need your compassion and your help, even if they're not on the payroll anymore. So even if you have to let people go, it's valuable to have a point person in the organization. So if they have questions about you know, when they might come back, they can have those answers given to them. Um, you can help people navigate government assistance programs. Just because they're not coming to the office, virtual office every day, doesn't mean they don't still have needs that need to be addressed. And so this first set of needs refers to people's existential needs. What can you do to help manage those? And it's important, not only today, but down the road. I saw on, I think it was on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, there was a guy who was saying, for the rest of my career, the first question I'm asking in every job interview is, what did you do to protect your employees during the pandemic? Consider how, what you can do now. The next set of needs are relatedness needs. And relatedness needs refer to all the needs that we have that involve relationships with other people. And we are social creatures. And uh, our relationships are one of the most effective ways for us to deal with stress, it, which we're all experiencing these days. In a classic experiment done dec decades ago, researchers told one group of people that they were going to give them a very mild electrical shock. And in the second group, uh, they told people, we're going to give you a very intense, painful electrical shock that will, will really hurt, but it's not going to cause any permanent damage. Crazy, right? And then they asked both groups of, of people, they were doing this individually, so they asked the individuals, do you want to wait, as we prepare to run this study, do you want to wait alone in a room by yourself, or do you want to wait with other people? And what they found was the people who thought they were going to receive a very strong electrical shock, almost twice as many of them chose to wait with other people, demonstrating how strong our need for relationships is when we're in stressful circumstances. Another evident piece of evidence on how important relationships are is that the mortality risk, the death risk of a lack of social connection is stronger than that of smoking and alcoholism, right? Loneliness causes death more often than these other health risks that we know are very damaging for us. So schedule some extra time for people to, you know, at your next meeting, have 15 minutes for people to just shoot the breeze. 
or have a once a week, we do this where, where I work, have once a week, people just get together, have a kind of a hallway conversation online just to see how things are going. You need to maintain that social connection and it's important to engage, not just participate. There's some, some controversial research right now going on, but it's demonstrating that, um, for example, if you go onto Facebook, but you just peruse, that leads to depression. But if you engage, if you participate, then you feel better. So you have to connect with people. Don't just be the wallflower. Allow your emotions to, to connect with other people. And that's going to really do go a long way towards satisfying your need for relatedness and feel better. And the last uh, component of the ERG theory is the, our growth needs. So growth invo involves all the needs that we have to be productive, both in terms of the work that we do and in having an effect on our environment and becoming all we can be. And one of the ways that we satisfy that need is by feeling that our work is meaningful. And we can have at least two ways in which our, our work can be meaningful. There's meaning in work, which has to do with the tasks you're assigned. And if they're allowing you to grow and develop and demonstrate some autonomy and individuality and, and initiative and innovation, then you feel that there's meaning in the work that you're doing. The danger in stressful circumstances is that both at, at the individual level and at the organizational level, when stress hits us, we tend to narrow our perceptions individually and organizations tend to consolidate their operations, which limits the amount of autonomy and innovation that can go on on the fringes and strips people of some of their meaning in work and can undermine your innovation. So operationally and psychologically, it's potentially damaging. There's a piece, there was a piece in, recently in the Harvard Business Review that talked about one of the mistakes um, organizations make during stressful crises is they narrow their focus. It's a problem. The second way to think about meaning is meaning, meaning at work. And this has to do with enhancing your feeling of group membership. What, what organization do you belong to? And does it give you a sense of meaning to belong there? And, you know, I'm a perfect example of how I experience meaning at work by, you know, when I hear about U of G donating 10,000 masks to frontline employees, and opening up its residences so those employees can stay away from their families and not infect them and preparing meals for the hungry, it makes me feel so proud to be associated with an organization like that. So what can you do in your organization to help people satisfy their growth needs and feel good and enhance their well-being? So that's that first bucket. And it takes just a couple of minutes to talk about the next bucket, which is about, you know, if you are trying to help others be at their best, instead of helping them satisfy their needs, you're gonna have a tough time doing that if you yourself are not at your best. And so you need to recharge your batteries, get back to top form. And there are a few little ways that I happen to have studied recently that can help you accomplish that. So let me talk about those briefly. And again, there are three pieces to consider. The first piece is you wanna consider the resources that you're using up every day. In order to be at your best, you need to make sure that those resources that you're using up get replenished when you're not working. Now, in a crisis like we're experiencing, one of the main resources that we are draining ourselves of is attention and concentration, because we're all paying attention to the media so much, right? And we saw in our poll, about 33% of us are saying we have media overload. We see in the media the importance of reducing uh, the amount of media we're consuming, and that's good advice. I'm gonna give you the same advice, but I'm also gonna give you just a little bit of data to show you, drive home the importance of this. Um, there was a study that was done that looked at people's stress levels after the two, 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. And what they found was people who consumed the most media about the bombings were nine times more likely to suffer an acute stress episode than people who consumed less media. Similarly, and this blew me away when I, when I learned this, it was just recently, the highest consumers of, of the bombing media they had higher acute stress episodes than those who were directly exposed to the bombings, right? So the media keeps in the forefront of your mind the stressor. You need to let that go. Um, you don't wanna ignore what's going on, but maybe give yourself an hour a day in the morning perhaps, not close to when you go to bed, so you're not gonna aggravate yourself at that time. Consume information, know what's going on, and then let it go. You don't need to be constantly exposing yourself. Other things that can help go for a walk, preferably in nature. It sounds trite, but there's a ton of research demonstrating that just getting outside, and particularly if you have a chance to be in nature, in the forest or by a body of water or in a park, um, it has demonstrable and consistent effects on our well-being, on our ability to perform. Meditation is fantastic, and you don't have to do a lot of it. 
um, three 20 minute sessions makes you better at your tasks. And after just one month of meditation practice, we can see changes in the white matter uh, concentration in our brain. So that's that first piece, those resources that you need to build back. The second piece is needs. We all have needs and we have psychological needs, but I'm just gonna focus on one need in particular that about a third of the group said they're having trouble with and that is sleep. Sleep is probably the most important restore, restoration mechanism that we have. And many people, it's about a third of the population, uh, actually more than that, doesn't get enough sleep. The CDC in the state says that, that inadequate sleep is a, is a public health emergency. Um, one of the reasons we don't get enough sleep in general is because we practice poor sleep hygiene. And particularly these days, if you're working at home and you don't have to get up to go to the office in the morning and you can go to bed whenever you want, you just, yeah, you go to bed, you wake up whenever you feel like it, like every day is the weekend. That's a mistake. It's really important to replenish yourself, to sleep well by practicing good sleep hygiene. So go to bed and get up at the same time every day. Of the two, getting up at the same time every day is the more important one. Your room should be cool about 65 degrees. Don't try to fall asleep. If it's not working, get out of bed and come back later. Uh, same thing if you wake up in the middle of the night after about 20 minutes or so, get up, get out of bed, read in the dim light or something and come back and try again. It works. Limit your alcohol intake. Limit the use of your bedroom if you can to sleeping. Don't work in there. Don't play video games. No reading. Keep your bedroom for, for sleeping. That's your needs. And the last piece that I'll go through quickly is unhooking. And un unhooking has two pieces. The first is relaxing. It's tough to do these days, but it's important to relax enough to be at your best. So meditation, again, is good for that. Practicing a hobby is good for that. Um, getting on a treadmill and, and doing some exercise is good for that. I mean, there's research demonstrating that just moderate exercise um, improves our mood or reduces our tension. Physiologically, right, we feel better. Um, in fact, one study found that moderate exercise has the same power to reduce depression as drugs does. It's amazing. And the last piece I wanna talk about is called psychological, psychological detachment. Um, I always say when I'm doing these talks in general, it's not enough to, to physically leave the office, you have to mentally leave the office. You need to turn your brain off at the end of the day. And so again, if you're working at home, practice boundary management tactics. Close the laptop, put a, put a paperweight on it, don't look at it, put the papers away, don't look at them only work between certain hours, that's temporal boundary management practices, practice communicative boundary management practices, let people know, you know, you can email me or text me anytime you want, but you're not getting a response from me unless it's between these hours. Now, hopefully you have a boss that allows you to do that, but if you're in a leadership position, you should be encouraging your people to do that so that you get a fresh batch of employees every morning. So listen, uh, these are tough times. Um, the best we can do during these times is to do the best we can. Um, there's going to be loss and suffering. Um, I myself know two people who uh, have succumbed to COVID, um, but we will get through this. And perhaps as a result of this, we'll have a new appreciation for well-being and uh, its importance in our lives. So with that, I'll pass it off to Sandeep. Thank you. Actually, Jamie, there was a question that came in for you. Sure. Um, it was, I've been having a lot of trouble concentrating. So what can I do about that? Well, I think um, right now, I think what's happening with a lot of people is it's not so much that they're having trouble concentrating. It's that they're having trouble not concentrating on what's going on. And so some of the things that I was talking about before will be helpful in that regard. I think something else that is helpful if I steal, this is the, based on research, I'm stealing it from sleep research. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend that you give yourself some, uh, some worry time. So uh, each day or whenever you feel that it's necessary, um, give yourself 15 minutes or half an hour, whatever amount of time you deem necessary, not close to bedtime, very important, not close to bedtime, uh, to think about and write down your thoughts about what's concerning you by committing them to paper and working through them a little bit, that has the effect of allowing you to purge them from your mind. Uh, so I think a lot, often what happens is we hold on to the thoughts that we have because we don't want to forget them where we're um, perseverating on certain ideas because we have in the back of our, mind, on our minds or in the forefront of our minds, some idea of how maybe we can deal with a stressor that, that's affecting us. 
And if, and we don't want to forget it, whether consciously or unconsciously, we don't want to forget it. But if we commit it to paper and we don't need to worry about it anymore, that has the effect. It's kind of cathartic. We can let it out of our mind. So one thing is give yourself some worry time, devote some time to that, get it out of your head. And that should free your, your mind up and allow you to concentrate better. Yeah, there was actually this uh, rule of thumb that my mentor taught me was that if something comes up that's super stressful, to actually schedule it from three days from now until then shelf it. And then if it's still of an urgent matter, then when it comes up at three days later, you can have your pity party or whatever it is that you need to do your freak out. But usually by day three, it's all simmered and it's passed, right? That's a great idea. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for that great presentation. We'll pass it over to Sandeep. All right. Are we good to go? Everything's working. Excellent. So um, I'm a relatively new faculty member in Guelph. I just started in January and it's a real pleasure to be part of this webinar. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for your always insightful thoughts. And I'm going to build on those thoughts by focusing a little less on sort of the individual reaction to this unprecedented environment and more on leadership and what a couple of simple principles that leadership can use to help their employees in, in an incredibly stressful time. And so here I'm just going to share a few slides as I take you through the key points I wanted to share today. So first of all, it's important to note that nobody knows what's going to happen next. You know, I, I've been unfortunately reading the news nonstop like everybody else. And there's a lot of people speaking very confidently about things we don't have confidence about. And I don't think that's useful. We, we need to start, especially us so-called advice givers, need to start from a point of humility. Nobody knows what's going on now because we're constantly getting new data, nobody knows what's gonna happen next, and all we have are constantly evolving guesses based on increasingly more accurate information. And this is only going to continue for the next few months. That's scary. You know, this is not how we usually live day to day. Sorry, Sandy, if you can't see your slides. Oh, that's highly problematic. Yeah, so it, you'll just need to select sh share screen. There we go. There we go, you're, you're in business. So. So if you okay. just want to slide that in presenter view. Sure. Because we can Thank see you. all of your slides right now. Okay, perfect. And then let's see if I can hide this side screen. There we are. Okay, so having highlighted, you know, the fact that we're in this position of chaos, uncertainty all the way down, you know, what can we do? What, what, are, what are the consequences for mental health? And so, you know, given these wide ranging effects, health, social, financial consequences, nothing in our lives is untouched. And the reality is that even if some of us are lucky and you know, still have our jobs, still have partners, still have social connections in other ways, it still doesn't matter because we're part of a society connected to others. Others are suffering. And so from my personal point of view, from the view of many people, given that we're a very cooperative social species, we're experiencing collective trauma right now. All of us are. And so one thing we can do, one piece of advice I'm comfortable offering is employee uh, leaders can double down on fairness. And the reason that I'm comfortable offering this advice is because fairness is always a good deal. It's always something that's going to enhance organizations. It's going to increase performance as well as employee health and well-being. And so there's no shortage of evidence. You know, this is one of the key things that we teach in our organizational behavior classes, in our management classes, a theme that comes up in management over and over again is that fair leaders, people who treat their people with respect, dignity, and justice, experience better outcomes in the workplace and have employees that also experience better health and well being. And these principles are particularly important right now because justice and fairness offers at least some predictability against the current situation of chaos, this current situation of uncertainty, fear, and loss. And so, I just wanted to briefly provide some very concrete suggestions that people might find useful um, in, the, in the domain of justice. Basically, thinking about ways that we can put basic fairness principles to work. And so one of the basic principles is interactional fairness or justice. And this is basically about whether or not you as a leader are giving your employees full and honest information about your decisions. 
And there's a great example of this at play right now. You know, every day we see news conferences with doctors Teresa Tam, Bonnie Henry, you know, all of these public health officials that are public workers that are dedicated to science and evidence and unlike politicians don't have to try and sell simple solutions. They're just trying to commu in, communicate information to people accurately every day. And that's something we can do and something that people often don't do. You know, we think that giving bad news is always bad that we have to manage others, but oftentimes bad news is best taken when people are given full information about why these things are happening. And so if you give people this information, if you treat your workers with dignity and respect, you're going to get a lot better outcomes overall and your workers are going to be healthier and happier. On the procedural side, are your decision-making policies clear, consistent, and thoughtful? People don't like uncertainty at the best of times. They don't like uncertainty in how rules operate. They'd want to know how they're going to be rewarded for their work. They want to know they need meaning, they need direction, they need purpose. And leaders can help this again by providing honest information and using that honest information to construct very clear policies, especially in this incredibly uncertain environment. And so a great example, again, from the public sphere is Ontario's government plan to reopen. Unlike a lot of plans that have put concrete dates on things, I personally really think that Ontario's plan is excellent because it's flexible, but informed by explicit data-driven decision points. You know, as a, a, an instructor of decision-making principles, the first thing I tell my students is always that processes, good processes, lead to better outcomes more consistently. If you reverse engineer just on outcomes, you're now selecting for luck instead of good processes. And then finally, there's distributive fairness. And this is about how resources are distributed based on the two preceding steps. Given the clear information that you're using to make decisions, given the clear policies that result from these decisions, does it then manifest in appropriate allocation of resources? Are the right people getting, you know, opportunities to work? Are the right people being allocated resources that allow them to work remotely more effectively? And a great example of this from the public sphere is that government responses at the federal level have affected both businesses and individual Canadians affected by COVID. And so using very basic principles about who needs what and why, the government is allocating resources accordingly. And so all of these principles, so those three are sort of textbook principles that we talk about in many different management classes, but they're all very clearly manifested in the directions from the gold standard CDC pandemic handbook. Now the CDC doesn't look particularly great in 2020, but that's unfortunately a bit of a political problem given that the Trump administration has basically shut down what was the world's greatest public health organization. And their recommendations have been used in hundreds of countries worldwide to manage public health issues. And so their principles are to start with empathy. You know, this is a no brainer. The least we can do is understand the difficulties that the people that we work with are going through. Second, we need to identify and explain the threat. This is basic interactional justice. What are we dealing with? What are the problems? What kind of constraints and costs are, that impo are those imp things imposing on your organization. Third, you have to explain what is currently known and unknown. There's a lot we don't know right now, and leaders that are pretending and blustering to have confidence in a time where we don't have much are just revealing themselves to just not be very accurately calibrated to the situation. Again, interactional justice principles come to play here where you treat people with respect, information, dignity. Fourth, you have to explain what actions are being taken and why. This involves sharing possibilities. It involves thinking through possibilities in the future. You know, what if things get worse? What if things get better? We need to be able to plan for all kinds of contingencies. You know, again, processes are best to invest in because outcomes are too, too resultant on too many random processes. And then finally, you want to emphasize a commitment to the situation. You know, this is a crisis that will not be going away anytime soon. There are a lot of optimistic takes about being freed in months or weeks, but we don't know. We don't know. Again, going back to that emphasis on humility, we don't know what's coming next. And so just taking this all together, summarizing, 
it's really important that every single one of us, whether it feels like it or not, is experiencing some consequence of this collective trauma. There are few global or societal disruptions that are this historically consequential except for war. And so one solution that is almost certainly going to be positive, even, even if we weren't in this crisis, this is something I suggest to people all of the time, doubling down on fairness is almost never going to be a waste of your resources, time, or effort. And so I'll leave this with a quote, people prefer the certainty of misery over the uncertainty, the misery of uncertainty. Give people evidence and reasons for why you're making your decisions and they're going to be more willing to follow you moving forward. That's great, Sandeep, if you could just stop sharing your screen, I do have a question for you. Certainly, I am seeing a connecting window, unfortunately. There we go, all right. Awesome, so the question was, um, are there any differences in how people cope with uncertainty? Absolutely. So um, we know from research in clinical psychology that there are very strong individual differences in how comfortable people are with uncertainty. You know, some people can navigate it very well and they're less affected by it uh, as far as mental health goes. Others are particularly affected by uncertainty. You know, I, as a particularly anxious person, am highly agitated by this current environment. You know, it's an anxious environment. There's a lot of unknowns and I'm a planner. You know, I'm somebody who tries to make plans around things that might go sideways. And it's very hard to do that given the environment of uncertainty right now. And so I think it's important to understand that individual responses to this aren't going to be universal. Everybody's going to have their own experiences. And it's important to, you know, a lot of the tips Jamie offered, they're not goal, uh, they're not universal. You have to, figure out what works for you. You have to understand your own situation, your own stressors, and go from there. And so understanding how you deal with uncertainty personally might help with the solution. Perfect, that's great. Um, Jamie, I'm not sure if you just wanna hop back on video here with us, um, but we're going to open it up to the main Q&A. Um, but I, th I thought that this is very interesting on what both of you spoke about as far as, um, the poll reflecting that a lot of people were worried about the future. And so it's interesting because Jamie talked a lot about how to fill up your own bucket and, you know, gather those resources and you're talking about fairness. And, and so there seems to be a lot of overlap and how, you know, media consumption ties into this worry, lack of fairness maybe in the workplace might contribute to that. I'm not sure if you had any contributing thoughts to this kind of idea that's kind of rolling around in my, my head from this presentation. About the future and like how to deal with the uncertainty of yeah, and just how people were saying like that they're really worried about the future. That seems to be the biggest obstacle right now of what's, you know, possibly impacting the sleep, you know, the, the media consumption, all of these things, our relationships and our overall mental health. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's a lot of overlap. There seems to be a lot of overlap in what you and Sandeep are talking about. Well, let me say this. Sure, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. Uh, we're, we're all concerned about the future. Um, and our, you know, so many of our plans for the future are being thrown up into the air right now. In the end, we, we can only do what we can do. We can only control what we can control. Uh, we can control what's happening right now. In, in a sense, you know, there, there are um, therapists and philosophers, uh, theologians, who, who will talk, discuss the fact that right now is all we have. The past is gone. The future is not here. Right now is all we ever have. And we have to live in the moment. We certainly want to plan for the future to the extent that we can. We want to let the past go, uh, you know, have good memories, but don't be bogged down by broken relationships, et cetera. But all we ever have is right now. And when I think about, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about well-being and um, I myself have, have contemplated what, what, what's in store for me in the future. What's in store for my kids for the future? I don't know. And so much of that, 99% of that is out of my hands. And so I wake up in the morning and I say, okay, I have another day. Mm -hmm. And here I am today now. And I try to be in the moment 
because that's all I can control. Right. Yeah. A question came in about, you know, how this is the outcome influenced by how information is communicated, you know, so a lot of us are moving virtually. So what might have been communicated face to face is now being done in a mass email. So are there tools or concepts that should be applied from a leadership perspective within the workplace? Um, and maybe even just within your own family too, right? Having difficult conversations. I, I think this touches on informational justice here. Um, people like being treated with dignity and respect. They like being listened to. They like recognizing that they're, you know, worth spending the time and effort for. You know, this is the same reason that people don't break up via text. You know, it's it's a it's widely seen as not a great thing to do because it actually violates interactional justice, informational justice. And so I think that it doesn't cost a lot for leaders to just pick up the phone or maybe try a video chat for sharing bad news. I mean, I, I just don't see high costs there. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo Sandeep's ideas. Um, it, it bears on what, we were, what I was talking about before and the connection. And just because it's efficient to send out an email, uh, you, you wanna think about what the objective of sending the email is. If it's simply a matter of conveying information, data, then that's fine. If it's something a little bit more sensitive where you're trying to appease the masses or um, you know, make people feel better or satisfy some need for connection, that's not going to cut it. So you need to think strategically or tactfully about what it is you're trying to achieve with that message, because absolutely there is much more opportunity for fewer connections, emotional connections these days, which can have negative repercussions for people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to extend on that, there was a, a comment slash question in the Q&A about a circumstance in the workplace where, you know, change is happening really rapidly um, and everyone kind of seems to be functioning on different levels. And so some are, you know, resisting change, other embracing it. So there's all these different layers to it. And so, um, you know, there's this search for meaning in the shared agenda and work and so now we're all virtual so how would you recommend in building alliances from a distance in that type of scenario sandy if you want to go you want me to feel that uh you can give a first go and i'll add if necessary <sighs> look so as sandy mentioned earlier everyone's different and as a result i mean every manager knows that the most challenging part of managing is not the operations it's the people side of things because everyone's different everyone's unique everyone has to be um, dealt with that as an individual right mm -hmm. the, the golden rule to treat others the way you want to be treated is a is an ineffective rule for managers like you want to implement the platinum rule treat others the way they want to be treated because they're all different mm -hmm. um, and yeah everyone's going to react to these circumstances in a different way some people have a very high stress tolerance uh, a very high tolerance for ambiguity other people don't more people some people are in the middle and so this, I, I often think of it this way, the power, the research on power, when people get power, um, what it does is it brings out who they are. So people who are naturally benevolent become more benevolent and people who are natural dictators become more dictatorial. And this stressful circumstance is doing the same thing. We're seeing it with companies. Some companies are becoming predatory and some companies, fortunately, I think most companies are becoming more benevolent. We're seeing the good side of them. It brings out what the, the essence of the individual and the organization is. And that becomes an important um, role for the leaders of the organizations is to, I mean, taking, taking an individualized, considerative uh, perspective on your people, right? Treating everyone as individuals has always been a key part of what we call transformational leadership. And now when people's core cells are coming to the fore because of the stressors that's allowing that to emerge, it becomes even more important for leaders to be sensitive with people and, and really treat them, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not gonna say treat them um, with kids gloves, but treat them the way they need to be treated. Give them what they need, right? That's the functional approach to leadership. You give people and you give your teams what's missing, whatever they need in order for them to thrive. And that's, I guess, a long-winded way to get at this issue of, yeah, that of course that's going to happen. Yeah, and I think that it's interesting because 
the analogy of this scenario was brought up on a webinar that I was on last week about we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. Some of us are on rowboat, some of us are on a ring rubber dinghy, some of us are on a big yacht, you know, so we all may be feeling the same storm, but we're all having very different experiences within that. And that I think that for some leaders, they may have felt this space to be a little bit more safe to be vulnerable where they might not have otherwise in the past, you know, and, and exposing some new strengths and qualities. Um, another question that came in, which is a, a really great, great question is, how do you balance procedural and distributive fairness when employees will need different approaches? So you've got people with children, you know, uh, schooling, compromised immune systems, you know, the gauntlet uh, of issues. So is it the equality is that like, how does that challenge, how do you overcome that challenge as a leader when you're, you know, Sandeep, you're recommending fairness as being a great uh, approach in this time? You know, this, this is a difficult question that manifests in different, in so many different levels. You know, if we think about it as a societal, uh, at the societal level, you know, obviously we don't operate under the principle that everybody should have equal outcomes. Some workplaces do. There are worker co-ops that operate under these principles. You know, these are sort of moral choices. And this question highlights a really unfortunate reality. You know, we can sit here and talk about enhancing well health and well-being all we want, but there will be people who disproportionately suffer. And even in workplaces that enact, you know, these fairness principles, there will be allocations of resources in certain directions or another. And here, I mean, there are no easy answers, but here I would just rely on, you know, there's a triple bottom line that one can consider if you're running an organization. You need to, without profits, you can't support your people and you can't support the planet. And so it's not enough to just want to treat everybody equally. Your, your organization needs to find a way to survive in this harsh environment. But people being heard, people understanding that their issues are really paying attention to your employees, even if they're going through a hard time, even if you have to give them additional difficult news, listening to people, hearing them goes a surprisingly long way. You know, a lot of leaders are really hesitant to give bad news. They're, they're going to give bad news via an email because they don't want the personal difficulty of a hard conversation. But these principles demand, you know, humans need dignity. And so bad news can be delivered in a humane way. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, organizations need to do everything they can to, to make sure everybody's having the identical outcome. It's just dignity is a principle that can be equally applied, even if the outcomes are not necessarily the same. Yeah, and th this is actually a great segue into the next question. There's a few leaders. Uh, Dr. Jamie Grumman, this is more directed to you and more of, you know, you recommending this self-action and ownership um, during these times. Um, and do you have recommendations for encouraging applications of these strategies from a leadership perspective? Because there's leaders in the crowd here today that are saying, you know, I want to positively answer the question, what did I do for my team during COVID? And Sandeep, I'm sure you probably have some add-ons as well. So my first answer to that is um, ask them. The, I think so many leaders feel this heavy burden of leadership and they're, they're unsure of, of what the role asks of them. And uh, one of the things I'm fond of reminding leaders is that you don't have to have all the answers. You're, you're the person who is going to, in the end, perhaps be the person that makes the decisions but you don't have to come up with all of the solutions. You've got a lot of people that work with you who are really bright and you know, many of whom want your job and have a lot of really good ideas. And so ask them what they think needs to be done. And I think of like Jean-Luc Picard on, on, in the, on the enterprise. And you know, if, if for those who watch the show, he never made decisions himself. He always asked for input and then chose what he thought was the best answer or integrated answers. Um, that's, that's a, I think, a very effective way to think about leadership is you don't have you can take that weight off your shoulders you don't have to be the one the brilliant person coming up with all the solutions you've got a lot of people that you can work with that can help you navigate uncertainty does that answer the question i don't know if it does yeah i think that's great sandeep do you have any thoughts to add on to that 
I would just agree completely with Jamie and just suggest that the best leaders, the most effective leaders are connectors of ideas and people. And yeah. Yeah. that doesn't mean that you have to generate all of these things yourself. It means that you have to recognize the gifts that the people that you work with can offer and how in cooperation you can accomplish even greater. Yeah, it's actually reminding me of this pivotal moment. I just finished watching uh, Save the or the Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And there's a moment in the documentary where he realizes that he has to utilize the other players on the team. But up until that point, he felt solely responsible. And I think that a lot of leaders feel that heavy bearing and so he goes to the coach and the coach says who's open and he goes Paxton's open and he goes well pass him the ball it was like you know this revolutionary idea but then it was that moment of you know building that trust um and, and knowing that there's other people in your tribe that are there to help support and contribute and and, and be a part of the process right um, just quickly scanning through here, we'll have time for one more question. Um, so how do you, how can you, how can organizations prioritize the well-being of vulnerable populations? So uh, minorities, people with disabilities, and what steps can organizations take to address this? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind again is, uh, is special populations will have special needs. And so if we integrate some of what, what I was saying with some of what Sandeep was saying, if we want to be uh, fair and responsive to people, then again, it's really a question of determining what special needs these special populations have and doing our best to satisfy them and keep them protected and keep them uh, effective. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess we'll leave on one final note because this came up a few times in the chat. At, but it's uh, asking to have a little bit of a conversation around performance management in a remote environment versus mm -hmm. in the actual physical work environment. Happy to take it, Sandeep, unless you want to. I, I would <laughs> suggest that perhaps um, there's a time and place where performance management is successful. This may not be the best time and place. I recognize the issue. I recognize that must motivate their employees and outcomes matter a lot. But um, until, I mean, we're again, going back to that uncertainty point I opened up with, we don't know what the workplace is going to look like next week. We don't look, know what it's going to look like a month from now. And so it's hard to effectively manage performance given that you don't even know the environment your employees are working in. Um, I recognize the importance though, and so I'm gonna to shift to, to Jamie to answer the hard question. <laughs> I, I'm gonna um, add to that this, uh, maybe two things. Um, the first is I've, I've always been a big advocate of uh, ROWE, R-O-W-E, which stands for Results Only Work Environments. Um, performance management has a long history of managing the process of work and uh, that's a legacy, it's a holdover from when we were a manufacturing economy and, um, but I think today, maybe not in every organization or every industry, but I think you, you can manage the outcome instead of the process. And so you give people their objectives. And I think these are also generally accepted management practices. You give people the outcome that they're supposed to achieve. You let make it very clear to them, uh, you know, the, the, the deadline by which you need something. You make very clear what the, the specifications are, what the quality standards are, and then you just let them do whatever they want. And, you know, when I, when I hire people, I say, you know, I don't care if you're sitting on the beach uh, doing the work, as long as it gets done by the time I need it and it's of good quality, I'm happy. And so I think in an environment like we're in, uh, to the extent that it's possible, is you manage the output, not the process. And you basically uh, leave people do what they're going to do. And if they don't perform, then that's a conversation that has to that you have to have, and that's where the performance management comes in. Um, but I don't think you manage the process, particularly when it's difficult to do so. A few years ago, I published a paper on um, what I call engagement management, and it was very similar. That in, in today's economy, it's very difficult to manage the process because oftentimes leaders don't even know what the work is. So that it used to be the case you would rise to the ranks and do everything yourself, but you don't anymore. And so you need to manage the environment in which the work is being done. 
And doing things like satisfying people's needs, giving autonomy to people who want autonomy, taking away some autonomy from people who have demonstrated they can't handle it, and, and rejigging as you learn more and more about the competencies and capabilities and interests of your people allows you to, to assign people to the right projects, put the right teams together, and keep an eye on the ultimate objective as opposed to micromanaging the process, which I don't think is usually necessary. Yeah, it reminds me of a paper that I wrote while I studied uh, at the University of Guelph and, and just employee engagement and that importance of creating psychological safety to nurture and foster that has to be present, right, in order to have em employees be engaged. And, um, you know, that's essentially what you're saying. And also to take what you presented on as well as, you know, the, the importance of clear and concise communication that both of you are hitting on is that, you know, that communication then builds that trust, which then builds that circle of safety. And it just kind of self perpetuates, right? And in nurturing that environment. And I hope that leaders um, take this advice and, and listen to what you're saying as far as not managing the process. And I love Sandeep that you, you know, are saying it's not about performance management at this point. There's so many other factors that require leadership's attention and energy at this point in time. Um, Jamie, we've had a few requests just uh, asking if you could speak a little bit more about your book Boost. It sounds like it could have some really supportive concepts for the times that we're in right now, um, not only as leaders, but as individuals. Happy to do so. Um, so the, the book, um, be careful not to talk for six hours. I, the book is about how to renew yourself and how to recharge your batteries uh, in the face of the daily demands that you have, whether it's paid employment or looking after young children or elderly parents, we have these resources that get drained, we need to replenish ourselves. Um, I would say to everybody listening, uh, you know, there's a, the book is available on Amazon, if you put my name in and boost, you'll find it, but um, you don't have to spend any money. If you just Google my name or go onto uh, YouTube, you'll find a, a TED talk I did on that topic. You can learn more about it there. Um, it, it is about filling the three buckets that I mentioned earlier, uh, resources, nourish, and unhooking, which produces the renew model, R-E-N-U, the renew model. And what the book does is, so this, this topic is, uh, has been very popular for a number of years in uh, the work world, in the academic work world, about recovery. And, uh, you know, we get fatigued and what, what are the best ways, what does science tell us are the best ways to uh, overcome the, the draining effects of our obligations. And so I summarized everything in, in this book and it is the figuring out what resources you're using on a daily basis. And so if you're working, um, for many of us, we're drawing on physical resources, like if we're emptying boxes out of an 18 wheeler, uh, but also a lot of psychological resources. So concentration, self-control, uh, you know, maintaining a smile on your face when you're dealing with difficult people. Uh, and then, so if you're using that resource and then you were maybe not now, but previously going out for dinner on Friday night with a new couple and you have to be in a good mood, you're drawing on the same resources. You're going to keep yourself depleted. You're not going to get a boost. Um, and the boost is in enhancing your psychological well-being, your physical health, and enhancing your ability to get your work done. That's what boosting is all about. So if you fill, replenish your resources and then if you satisfy your needs, uh, physical needs like sleep, but also your psychological needs for things like you need for relatedness, which we were discussed, but also you need for autonomy uh, to, that need to feel like your actions are freely chosen and uh, your need for competence to feel that you're skilled, which of course can happen when people give people assignments like we were talking about earlier that allow them to challenge themselves. Um, and then finally the unhooking, which is relaxing and psychologically detaching. Those are the three that summarizes, I think everything we know these days at this point about what's needed to recharge your batteries effectively. So it's, um, so labor of love is fun to write. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like a great book. And Sandeep, I think this question would be more directed to you. Um, there's a few people that are um, talking about finding it difficult to communicate with coworkers remotely. Um, and there's a lot of frustration around the day-to-day -day functions than previously. So um, how can this be explained or changed for the better? How do they influence that more effect, effective or efficient communication? Well, I, again, going back to something I talked about earlier, I think understanding is so important. And especially where emotions are involved, I think it's important not to respond to the emotions, but to the thoughts, the cognitions that are driving the emotions. And so 
if somebody's angry or frustrated, it would be particularly useful for a leader to ask about, so I'm hearing you're frustrated. Why do you feel this way? And just listening to people's reasons for why they're feeling what they're feeling, even giving them a, a platform for catharsis can often contribute to the solution to the problem. Once somebody feels like they're they're being heard, you can now start to have an honest conversation about solutions. Here are the costs, here are the benefits, here's why you're feeling this way, here's what we can do. But honest communication really is the key, understanding empathy. I mean, people get emotional when they feel like they're not being heard, when I'm suffering something, but you don't understand. And so leaders can do a lot to bridge that understanding. And I think that can help solve the problem. There is no silver bullet to reducing conflict. There's always going to be conflict, especially in these incredibly difficult times. But I think compassion and understanding are useful tools regardless of the situation. So uh, this is interesting because there was a question in the Q&A about uh, leading authentically and this communication. So how do leaders harness that when they may be experiencing emotional distress and all this uncertainty as well, just like the rest of us, just like I had alluded to, you know, we're all in the same storm on different boats, right? Well, you know, there's a great example of this from the sports world. And so um, a few researchers have started looking at emotionality in sports and who shows emotions who shows vulnerability. And basically they've realized that people are most co comfortable showing vulnerability when they know that their abilities and who they are is respected and accepted. So I, for example, when I'm teaching my classes, when I'm advising my grad students, I mean, let's be honest, I'm an anxious mess. And I tell everybody this because it colors a lot of what I do. But the reason that I'm comfortable sharing this information is because I know I have these emotionality tendencies. Here's what I do to manage them. And I'm transparent about all of this. I have negative feelings. This is how I manage it. This is when it becomes overwhelming. This is when it's effectively, you know, sequestered. And through showing the process, I mean, this goes exactly to the point that I was trying to make through the presentation is transparency can be awfully magical sometimes. Yeah, well said. Jamie, do you have any add-ons to that thought? The only thing I'm, I'm thinking is um, emotionality is a, is a touchy issue. Um, on the one hand, yes, we want to be authentic, but we also need to recognize that uh, when we're in a leadership position, our people are looking to us for, particularly in a, in a crisis like this, our people are looking to us for some stability and some security, and they want to see if we think of in terms of the functional approach to leadership where the leaders give the group or the individuals what they need, if they themselves are anxious, what they need is a rock to grab onto, then you want to be able to give them that rock. Uh, the same way you would do with, with you know, an ill child. You don't want to necessarily show, you want to show empathy as Sandeep was saying, but, but I think, you know, and there's research on this, you know, if you cry, for example, at work, that's not good for your career. Um, now, I would say, partly because so much of my work is about humanizing the workplace, you know, if you're a leader and you're stressed and you want to have a good cry, you know, I would say go for it, but not at work. Wait until you're at home uh, or, you know, in the shower and no one's going to see you. And in fact, there's research demonstrating that, you know, crying serves a regulatory function. It, it regulates our heart rate. It's actually functional, it's beneficial. And so there's a place for emo emotionality, but there is also a place, and this is part of the problem I've had with authentic leadership, is there is also a place for um, playing the role of the leader and doing what um, your people expect of you in terms of you know, implicit leadership. People have an idea of what a leader is supposed to act like. And we've, we stray from that stereotype um, we have to do so cautiously because it can undermine people's perceptions of us right. as leaders. Yeah, so well said, well said. Um, well, I really want to thank both of you for your time this afternoon. It was such a pleasure to have this engaging conversation and to learn from each of you. Um, and I know that the attendees are giving some great feedback and just saying that this was really spectacular and very, very thankful for your time. That concludes our weekly webinar on employee morale and well-being. And I want to thank the listeners for attending. Next week, our webinar, we will dive into the financial impact that is that this pandemic has had on uh, Canada and the global economies and the strategies that local businesses have taken. 
It's going to feature Lang School finance professor Nicola Grajevec and president and CEO or COO rather of Linamar Jim Jarrell. Thank you again for attending this afternoon. Thank you uh, to both of you, Dr. Rishna and Dr. Jamie Kruman, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.